All right. Hello, welcome everyone also from my side. I, I can only join Holger in saying I'm, I'm super excited for this to happen, to see you all here, to see what this conference has become, that, you know, new venue, it kind of feels like, like growing up a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm, I would like to talk to you about um, stream processing and, and applications today. Um, but, but before, before I, dive, I dive into that, I, you know, I'd like to do a quick, a quick um, you know, state, of the, state of the scroll, state of Flink update. It's uh, what, I, what I like to do in all these uh, conferences before, and I think it's kind of become an, a nice tradition to continue. So, um, yeah, what, is, what has the year in Flink, in Flink been like so far? Um, Holger gave you a bit of an, you know, a, an overview of the community and uh, how it has developed so far. Um, let me just add a, a little bit of, um, of, uh, of details to that. Um, just a few, a few highlights um, I found over the last months. So in, in August, Flink passed 10,000 stars on, on GitHub for the first time. And it's kind of interesting to see, you know, it's only been actually half as much towards the beginning of this year. So 2019 really is, is the is kind of the, you know, the, the big taking off year here. Um, the, the thing that made me especially proud to read this year is that uh, in the last Apache annual board report from 2018, we saw Flink being in the top three projects in Apache by mailing list activity. And I think that is quite an achievement. I mean, the Apache Software Foundation has been our, what, maybe 210 ish, 20-ish projects or so. So being in the top three of those is... I think is an achievement. Um, top three by mailing list activity, that means healthy discussion between community members. And I just want to say a, a, a big thank you to everyone who is, who is participating in that. Um, I, I understand that our mailing lists aren't perfect, but I think we're, we're trying to do a very, um, we're trying to put a lot of effort into, into doing, doing very good community um, support from committers and contributors for other committers and com contributors. And I think this, this kind of shows that this, seems to be largely working out and is very much appreciated. So a hand for everyone who is helping with that. Thank you very much. I would, I would actually say, um, you know, if, if this is based on the, on the report from 2018 and we actually look at the chart here from uh, 2019, how actually the, the community discussion around both new features and, you know, and, and, and user use cases and so on has developed. I think there's a fair chance that 2019 is actually going to see a smaller number than three here. So let's, uh, let's see what we're going to recap at the next thing forward. I'm, I'm pretty excited. And, um, yeah, if we look at the, uh, at, at how the last releases in the Flink community have developed, one, the 1.9 release, for those of you that have followed it a little closer, it was a release that, that took us quite a lot of time. It was quite a bit of work, but there's also a pretty good reason for that. If we just look at the number of, uh, of, the number of contributors that were involved in, in this single release, 190 people, um, almost a thousand like, small issues that were, small to large issues that were resolved in this release. Um, 2,000 commits, I think this accounts for almost uh, 20% 20, 20 or so of all Flink commits over time in, in this one release, there was, um, it was, there was a big feat. And, and the fact that you know, the community actually made this come together in the end, again, a very, a very big thanks to everyone that, that was involved in, in making, this, making this happen. So um, let, let me take a few minutes to recap before I start talking about uh, applications, what, what was actually happening in, in Flink for the, for the past six months, because I think it builds a nice bridge to, to the next step. Um, there's been a lot that has been going on in the last six months. It's very hard to sum it up in, in, a, in, a, like in a single point for a project as big as, as Flink is today. But if there's, if there's one sentence that, that would capture it, I think it would be, you know, state-of-the-art batch processing on a stream processor that has been uh, very much a community focus over the last six months. Because there's always been this vision of batch and streaming coming together, and there's always been a very strong, you know, a very strong focus on the streaming side. And I think the last six months were very much focused on saying, like, yeah, let's actually, you know, let's actually make this come together. Let's actually um, strengthen, the, strengthen the batch side and, and make this, this vision um, 
you know, become, become as real as we, we've always said it. And, and, and maybe that's an even nicer way to put it, you know? If you look at, um, if you actually look at batch processing in Flink 1.8 versus Flink uh, 1.9 and 1.10, I think there's, uh, there's quite, an, quite an evolution that has happened. Um, there's got to be at least one squirrel picture in every, in every presentation keynote, so um, this is it. Here, um, you've, you've seen them. All right. Um, but, you know, actually adding, adding a bit more, more realness rather than just a squirrel picture to that, what, what, what we, were we actually working on in the past six months? Um, there's a lot of, of work just on making, you know, making fault tolerance in batch work how, how you would expect it would work and to integrate with, with a lot of other tools that exist in this ecosystem, to create a Python API for the table API, to integrate with catalogs and Hive, to really rebuild our runtime in, in such a way that, the, that we're not building basically two systems that just look like it's one system, but they're really two stacks that sit next, to, sit next to each other and other than being in the same project have little to do with each other. We're actually building, I would say, the first truly unified single runtime that is true streaming and can also do batch. Um, we had the very big contribution, um, the Blink query processor that, uh, that got to a good extent merged in, in Flink 1.9. And there's even more, there's even more threads around this, um, around this development going on. So there's, um, there's work on a new scheduler, addition for Python UDFs. There's this uh, weird thing called underline checkpoints. Um, if you're interested in that, it's, I think it's one of the most fundamental changes that's going on in Flink, I think, since, since its creation and, you know, and, and rethinking streaming for tolerance. Um, and and so, many, so many other parts that, yeah, are, are basically contributing to, to strengthening the story. All right, so a way you, you, might, actually you might actually experience a lot of these things as a, as a Flink user is in, in the way also that the, the stack of Flink has, has changed over the last, over the last releases. So um, it's always been a bit of a a bit of a thing that there was this, you know, data stream API and data set API. It's, it's a system that can do both, but it still has these two APIs that don't really go together um, in a way that, you know, that they, they would kind of expect them to go together. And there, there's good reasons for that. Um, if you attend the talk later by uh, Alyosha on, you know, unifying batch and streaming, he'll basically explain why it had to be that way. But we're also making a good headway and starting to, to really get these things together. And the first part in Flink 1.9 where we, uh, we really managed to get things together was in the table API um, together with the, you know, with the runtime that actually is the, first, is the first runtime stack that is truly unified between batch and streaming around the new uh, Blink query engine. And um, this, is, this is really a step towards a stack that looks more like, like that in the future releases, really what we, what we would like it um, to be like, you know, um, a, set of, a set of APIs that, that transcend batch and streaming or, you know, to navigate between batch and streaming as, as, you, would, uh, as you would get it in a, in a smooth way from a, from a system that really does this integration and in as deep as ranked as it. Okay. Um, Let's actually, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the batch and streaming part, batch and streaming integration. Um, in, in, in the big thing that is stream processing, um, there's, there's another side to, yeah, there's another side to stream processing. That is exactly what, what I would like to, um, to talk about as the, as the main topic of this, of this presentation today. Let's, let's, look at, um, let's look at building applications in the context of stream processing. And we've talked about data processing, um, batch and stream processing, as you know, as, as uh, ways of doing data processing um, in the past minutes. But there's also another side to stream processing beyond beyond that edge, and that that is really the part where, where stream processing is the technology that makes that data processing side and the application side come together. It is, um, yeah, it is it is the technology that that kind of brings data processing into the application in, in many ways. And um, we're, you know, this, is, this, has, not been, um, this has not been an, an, an age-old trend, I would say. If you go back a few years, there was, there was a pretty clear separation between the applications being built on, on databases and, you know, data processing being, you know, my produced jobs and, and so on. 
Um, but you know, I think with with the popularity of stream processing, these things have have grown grown closer and and closer together. And um, we, we've actually seen a lot of good talks around um, around exactly that. Also at the at the Flink Forward conferences, we've seen people that build an entire social network on stream processing. We've been we've seen. I think it was actually mentioned in the opening video. Uh, nice applications that build. Um, you know, real-time pricing models or tra uh, traffic forecast and so on, um, which is where, you know, the stream processing um, application really brings the, let's say, the, the real-time knowledge to the application. So stream processing used, uh, is being used as an accessory to the, to apl to the application to, you know, to provide, provide context and provide um, real-time information. So if we look at... If, we, if we're seeing this trend, I think the natural question to ask next would be what, what could, what is actually, you know, what can stream processing bring to, to building applications themselves? How can we, you know, how can we maybe use some of these, um, some of these nice properties and experiences that we have and not just say stream processing is what, you know, connects the data processing and the application, but really this is where they, they really come together and become one thing. And yeah, for that, maybe let's take a step back and, and really look at what, what, do the, what do the Flink users use today when they build applications. And this, this ran, seemingly random set of logos is just based on, on, on some searches when, when I was you know, going, through, going through the mailing list and looking for something that is mentioned in the context of, you know, we have the stream processing job and we're also running a Spring Boot application here that, you know. Um, yeah, so. What, what do actually users use to um, to build applications today? There's there's a few um, there's a few things that um, that come up on the mailing list, some more more than others. But there's one category that I think is especially interesting because it, it it's coming up actually more and more these days, and um, that is the that is the right hand side, the um, function as a service category. And um, I, I hope you'll kind of um, Forgive me for a moment to 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 say okay I'm 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 assuming for just for the simplicity here to not always say function as a service and serverless I'm kind of using them as a as a synonym even though they're they're not strictly the same thing. Um, yeah, so with all the with all the technologies for application building, there's there's one that yeah this this side of this side of the um, of the of the application ecosystem is is really becoming is really becoming um, much much stronger and um, if we if we look into into this a bit more um, what what is the core of functions as a service and yeah it is you know as the name suggests it's 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 an event driven function and that that I think is a very interesting starting point also to think about the like where's where does stream processing and the application come together because. An event-driven function, while you know, while event-driven is not stream processing, at least it, it shares a certain characteristic. Right? It shares the characteristic of, of being, yeah, being reactive to events, being you know, being reactive to individual events or reacting to a stream of events. There's, there's a there's a fine line between those. And there's also some really interesting properties that that these um, have brought to the table. And I guess the the most the most uh, prominent one being the the elastic scalability. Um, so whenever there's, you know, whenever the, the load increases, you can just the, a good function as a service system just automatically spawns more of these instances in order to to handle the load to keep up with it. And um, you know, as the as the load goes down, um, it will actually scale down again, which which kind of gives this whole system an I've called it a lightweight resource footprint. Maybe that's because you know of the whole. Uh, you know, sustainability and zero emission story or so. But what, what, it, what it really what it really means is, it's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a resource footprint that is let's say only as large as it as it really needs to be at any point in time. It's it's really good at you know adjusting to uh, run what you need and not more, resource wise. Um, you know, as good as this sounds, there's also you know there's also a reason why this this thing hasn't taken over the world instantaneously and. Um, I, I think one of the very um, one of the very common common problems that um, that were, you know that are discussed in this context is yeah what what do we actually do if we have more than the need to just run an individual function or more than just getting an event in and doing something based on that event what if we actually have an you know like most applications something that actually needs to work with state 
And, and when that happens, unfortunately, a good amount of the story starts not to, to, to fall apart. Um, we, have this, we have this nice, amazing scalability in the function layer. Of course, we also have scalable databases these days, but um, all of a sudden we have to start worrying about a lot of things again. We have to worry about state consistency with all these individual functions starting to interact with, you know, with the database uh, in, in random ways. We have very often um, the case that you know, when, when, we really, when things start to become, become slow and we need to scale out, it's not really the compute inside the function that is the bottleneck. It's actually the management or the, the interaction between those two layers, right? the, just accessing state, doing the I.O. and so on, um, becoming the problem. Um, while this part is very easy to scale, this part actually is, is much harder to scale. And, and while, you know, while I think modern cloud providers do a, do a good job in, in, in hiding it as much from, from that from you, as much from, of that from you as, as possible, I think whenever you go to a certain scale, you, you, you start seeing it. There's, uh, there's very little way around it. And you kind of start also, um, you start seeing this in, in certain, you know, pre-warming behavior and certain kind of pricing of, of different, um, yeah, of different, uh, you know, types of requests and so on. Um, and yeah, and you, you just, it, the whole serverless experience isn't really as smooth anymore when you have to start to worry about connection pooling, um, how to react to being blocked off due to exceeding um, request rates and so on. So while, yeah, while it's really made a good start here, I think when, when you look at the story of, of really building a stateful application, there's still, there's still way to go. And it's not that this hasn't been recognized. It's one of the most discussed things in, the, in this ecosystem. And I said it before, I'm, I'm kind of using function as a service and, 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 and serverless a bit uh, synonymous here. Um, most of the things that, that I mentioned before on functions as a service would, would apply in a very similar way if you say, you know, I'm not, I'm not using something like Amazon Lambda. I'm instead saying I'm, I'm building my own, you know, Spring Boot application. I have a stateless front-end server that I'm trying to auto-scale in a, you know, with, uh, with Knative, and then I'm, I'm using a database in the background. So for all the, for all the, um, for all the amazing developments that, that, that this ecosystem has done over the last years in, in, in making, you know, orchestration of the, of the compute layer, um, like really, really smooth, really sophisticated, really, really comfortable and powerful. Um, I think we're still surprisingly, there's still surprisingly a long way to go until the whole story comes together if you actually talk about, you know, the stateful application. And um, I'm, I'm, I put out those four seemingly random quotes because I, I really, I really liked them. When, when I came across them, they say it much better than I could possibly say it. Um, maybe except that, I, I can say that I'm angry about this being talked about so little. Um, yeah, maybe an, another thing that, that is somewhat related to that is also the, if you, if you build a more complex application, you usually don't, you don't stop at a single function or you don't stop at a single service, right? You're, you're really looking at, at, um, at composing them. And, and again, this isn't, um, this isn't the straightforward thing to do. Um, the, the way we still lack very powerful like composition primitives other than, you know, let's say the special case where it's a workflow. Um, yeah, it's also, there's, there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. And I'm, I'm closing the circle now because, you know, if we think about this, there's, we're looking for something that plays well with the event-driven space that has actually nice composable characteristics and, and has, you know, has actually shown that that, that state management can, can be easy. That, that, that sounds familiar in some sense. So that, that does sound like stream processing, right? So something, something in, the, in the event driven space that, that solves those two problems. So the, the question is really, what, what, can we, what can we take from each of, these, uh, each of these ecosystems? How can we take some of the nice properties that you know, stream processing technology has brought to the table over the last years? And I'm just putting those three bullet points out here as, as an example that, yeah, Stream processing has done a lot more, but those, those really, you know, those really fit well because they complement those, those properties that on the other side, the, you know, the serverless and function as a service ecosystem has brought. How can we, how can we combine some of these properties? Because if we, if we could kind of get those things together, that, that sounds like, like something really, really powerful. So that was, that was what we, um, that was what we were, um, yeah. We're asking ourselves, I think, probably beginning of this year, maybe six, seven months ago. 
when um, when we started working on this on this new project or started looking at yeah what what can we actually do to bring to bring something from the from the stream processing magic and the um, and the yeah, application ecosystem closer together. So it's kind of been a tradition that we announce things at Flink Forward Berlin, so we're going to do this this year again. Um, today we announce. Um, yeah, we've actually built we've actually built a um, a new project over the last six months that that tries to to do exactly this thing, like getting together some of these nice properties from the application and stream processing ecosystem. It is called Stateful Functions. The the name is very descriptive. It's actually a project that, well, is built on Stateful Functions, and the like. The mission of this project is bringing together ideas from stream processing and uh, functions as a service to, yeah, to create a new way of building stateful applications. It's gone live this morning. You can actually try it out if you want. Um, the, the URL is statefun.io. It, yeah, statefun is short for stateful functions and also because I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to work with this. And um, yeah, let, let me walk uh, you through what exactly, what exactly this is. Um, it is fully open source, so you know, if you want and get the Wi-Fi and everything working, you can actually check this out now. So the uh, maybe the gist of it is uh, is the following. Um, this th this picture is a is a high level view of what 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 stateful functions does. Um, at at its core are the you know namesake stateful functions, um, basically functions that form. Um, functions that are the, the building blocks of, of applications and that, that can call and message each other in a, in a pretty arbitrary way. So this is the first part where we're actually going, going away from the classical stream processing side. We're not actually writing a data flow DAG anymore. We're actually writing you know, distributed, distributed functions that, that message in, you know, in an arbitrary, possibly cyclic, possibly multiple round trip way. Um, let me walk you maybe through the through the big um, the big more, more or less features or so that that kind of make up make up the whole thing. Um, it is it's very much an event driven thing. So we're not we're not trying to build the next request response um, application framework here. But it is yeah it's based on um, it is based on many ideas from stream processing and event driven systems. So it it starts out with uh, what we call an event ingress. Um, which is a way to you know to su to supply events. Everything starts with uh, an event that tries to trigger a function, and these event ingresses can really be um, they can you know they can be a Kafka topic, they can be um, it can be a message queue, they can be um, they can even be an HTTP server. Um, the core of it is, is as I mentioned before, um, is is a basically a set of of functions that basically interact with each other. So each function you can think of them as like a, a very very small. Um, piece of a service. If you're familiar with actor programming, then you know this bears some similarity um, with actor programming, um, but it also has some some um, some uh, very important differences. Um, the first one is that each function has locally embedded state. That was something that everybody liked about stream processing. So it seemed like something we should carry into this model. So when, whenever you call a function, uh, you're inside a function and it gets invoked, that function will have local state in, in a local variable. So you basically can just work with it. Um, the functions can message each other arbitrarily and across everything, across the messaging and the state, um, you still get exactly one's guarantees. So you can basically do you know, think of it as like a way to do similar to cyclic stream processing in some way, right? You can kind of send events and you can send them back and forth and you'll still get the same exactly once characteristics that you get in other stream processing jobs. So when, when something fails, the, um, the state and the messages and so on, they're all rolled back to, to create the effect of a completely failure-free execution. Um, this whole system works without a database in the background. Um, of, of course, you can again see where this comes from. You know, it, it's uh, very much it's very much the Apache Flink way of doing things, right? So instead of saying we're we're creating you know we're creating some API that hides the database from you, and every time you interact with your state, what really happens is in the background it actually goes to a database. After all, we're really trying to to rethink how how to do this. And the the model of saying we're instead of working against a database, the the state here is really is actually locally in the, inside the processors, and we do fault tolerance in you know in, in gradual asynchronous snapshots. It's it's kind of worked well for for a lot of use cases. 
So we, we wanted to bring this there. And it, it, it does solve the problem of saying, you know, when you actually scale the part of the application, um, when what you really need to do is actually scale the database, that it kind of, you know, it kind of solves this by bringing these things closer together. And then the last part is if you want, you know, I mean, all of these functions can, of course, interact with the outside world, whatever they, however they want, and do, you know, do RPC calls and so on. But if you want a standardized way of, you know, responding to the outside world, something that's integrated with, um, with the exactly once guarantees, then you would use an event egress. Um, there's, there's one more really important thing here that is very different from actor systems also, aside from, you know, the way we, um, we do state management, management and fault tolerance. And that is the, um, the model of, of logical or virtual instances of these functions. So, um, yeah, L let's assume what we have is a, is a system with, um, with two shards, just, you know, be that if, if you think, you know, from Flink, it's to task managers or so on. And um, what, what we don't want is a system where you say, you know, we, we, you, put all these, you put all these functions in, you put all these functions just in, in memory and then you can message each other like you have in a classical actor system. Um, what we really wanted is, is a model that, that says, you know, you keep in memory what, what you need to have there. Um, you know, a function that needs to process will have its state and everything in memory, but, you know, if it's not being called for a while, it doesn't really need to be in memory. It doesn't need to occupy a thread. It doesn't need to occupy any resources. So this is where virtual instances come in. Um, the, the idea is that you actually model your application as, you know, as, as millions or billions of individual functions. Make every entity in your system an individual function, right? Make, you know, don't, don't have one service, for example, for, for the customer, one for the shopping cart, but model every item in the inventory as a function and, and send it a message, you know, reduce your inventory count by one. Make, really model every individual customer as, as a function and, um, and message it to, you know, update its, um, its own local status. So, for example, when we see that this, um, that this uh, you know, this function C actually wants to message something to function K, you will have the system route the message to K, it will actually activate the function, it will pull the, the state in memory, it will, you know, evict another function that hasn't been called in a while, um, and, and then, you know, and, invoke it. And, and this gives you really these, this nice model to say you can, you can work just with very, very many functions without having to, to account for, um, for the resources all the time. Um, yeah. So um, in, in a later talk, you'll hear a lot more details about this. Um, this is uh, something that if you come from academia, it's, it's kind of similar to the concept of so-called virtual actors. Yeah, so how, how does that all you know, like relate to stream processing and, and Apache Flink here? And um, of course it does. We, we didn't start the system, uh, this whole project completely from scratch because that, I think that would be a whole, a whole big undertaking, but we, we actually leveraged as much of Flink as we, as we could for that. Um, so if, if you think about what, what the system does, you know, trying to go back into the, into the, um, into the mind of a stream processing person, what, what do we actually do here conceptually? In some sense, it's this, stream processing job. We're starting from an ingress and a router that, you know, that tells us where do, where do functions need to go. And then we have this operator here with the function that executes one, and then it, it, sends, it sends it to the side to another function, and then it sends it back to the side. So if you, if you think on, on the Flink, on, on, from the Flink perspective, this is a job where you would have just, let's say, process functions sending messages sideways, if you wish, right? You have just different parallel instances of the process function matching each other, which is obviously something you cannot do in Apache Flink, right? Or in any stream processor, um, I think, these days. Because, yeah, there's this nature of, having, of data having to flow in a directed acyclic graph for a lot of the, you know, both scheduling, fault tolerance, um, and so on to work. So the way we put this onto Flink was actually employing um, like a simple but, but quite powerful trick, and that is, that's building a loop into the system. And this is almost, I don't know, this is almost a little bit like going back to, you know, going back to the university, the, if you remember, maybe the first, the first uh, semesters when, you know, there was theoretical computer science and, um, you know, computational theory and so on. And, and, and one, of these, one of these very simple um, results there is, you know, as soon as you have a while loop, you can do everything. <laughs> everything is complete, right? There's um, basically a, 
anything becomes Turing complete as, as soon as it has a while loop. And kind of this is the, uh, the equivalent approach in Flink, right? You, you, you basically you build in a loop and then you can run this whole thing as basically almost an, an interpreter for, for functions. So you, oops, you start out here with events, you basically route them to the, you know, by key to the logical instances that you call. And if one function wants to message another, it basically sends it downstream to another operator again by key, and those operators just logically loop it back in memory. So, um, so far actually so simple, but it, it, it works, it actually works um, incredibly well. The only thing that it, it needed is a bit of an extension of Flink's checkpointing mechanism to, to do exactly once checkpointing for, um, for streaming loops. So starting from the function dispatcher, whenever you send something to the feedback operator and, and you go back, um, at the point of a checkpoint, um, you know, barriers actually flow also through the feedback channel. There's a certain amount of capturing state of the feedback channel and so on. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a fairly lightweight mechanism in the end that, um, that can give you these guarantees. All right, so um, let's, let's just look at, uh, at, at one simple example. So I've explained a lot of the theoretical stuff, but just to give you a, a very short a very short impression that this is not a pipe dream, but this is actually something that, that works and that we've implemented it. Um, yeah, we, we're, we're trying to use this, this example here to, to motivate it. And apologies to everyone that actually works at a ride-sharing company and the audience. I don't mean to reduce the complexity of your company to this one slide, but it just makes for a really nice example um, because, you know, everybody knows ride-sharing, kind of, you know, everybody's used it and, and has, you know, followed this interaction of a passenger um, requesting a ride, the ride accessing, you know, and a GU index to find out drivers in the vicinity, contacting drivers, drivers placing bits that might, you know, selecting a driver and, and so on. So, yeah, this is actually one of the examples. If you go to the, to the website and the repository that you'll find there that is implemented, um, it is not a trivial example, but when you actually look at the code, you'll, you'll see that, you know, even though the interaction still needs like a lot of if then else's, you know, if the ride is in that status, if the driver actually accepts the ride and so on, you'll also see there's a surprising simplicity about it because being just able to rely on the messaging, being able to rely on the state, not worrying about, you know, the connection failures and retries and so on that you do if you actually compose distributed microservices. That it gives it, it gives it a, very, a, very nice, um, a very nice feel. So let me see if this, this works here. I need to... Um, okay. I'm trying to switch to, here we go. I'm trying to switch the screen to, to this example uh, running. So we've actually um, just, we've, we've taken the example that is there in the, um, in, in the repository. We've started it. There's a very simple visualization that, um, yeah, that, that, that moves cars across, um, yeah, across a map. And, and here's, here's the Flink job that, that is running it that, um, yeah, that, that was illustrating uh, before. You can, we can zoom in a little bit to actually, let, to actually show this a bit better. So yeah, we, we basically have this, um, this job with two different sources, one that takes, um, that takes driver events, one that takes passenger events. Most of the logic really happens in, in this, in this uh, operator here. It's the function operator. The, it's the function dispatcher from the previous slide. Um, and um, it's basically, you know, the, the, uh, the function dispatcher and the, uh, the sync ingress chained together. And then there is the, then there is the feedback operator, and this is really all that this this data flow, um, this Flink job is. It's just, yeah, it's basically just the the streaming fabric for, um, yeah, to to kind of interpret this uh, this setup. So different sources. Here's where all the work happens, and feedback. And um, yeah, so even though you have a lot of different function types, you have the driver functions, the write functions, and so on, they they don't they don't show up here, right? They just all get kind of as virtual instances executed together in this operator. And that, that does have a few very interesting characteristics, right? So first of all, um, let me actually just uh, change, change back to this other thing so we see something happening. Um, some of these nice characteristics are that 
you don't you don't have to start and reserve slots anymore for functions, right? So it doesn't it doesn't really depend on how many different modules of functions. Modules is is as a concept in in the um, in state for functions, just like a bundle of certain functions that that do things together. How many of them do you actually put into the application? It it doesn't change. It doesn't change actually the number of let's say slots that that you require. You don't need to think in terms of you know every function is going to have at least one thread. It's going to have at least 64 megabytes of memory because that's how much the RockDB write buffer is, and so on. It's just you basically just bring up one cluster uh, in, in in Flink that is the total amount of resources you want to you know dedicate to the whole thing, and then you know functions activate and deactivate as they're messaged. You you get you know it's not the exact same thing as serverless functions that scale out and in but you have you have a bit of a similarity in this and this notion of you know when you don't need resources you don't have you don't you're not holding onto a thread or to memory if you're not actually doing anything. Okay, let's go back to um, to this example. Um, yeah, so this is. Um, this is basically the, the gist of the, the project that, um, that we've developed there. Um, maybe if a few final words on, um, yeah, where does that actually fit into the whole space? Like, what, what, what is that supposed to be, you know, vis-a-vis -vis stream processing, vis-a-vis -vis functions as a service? Um, I believe that this is a very powerful building block for, um, for certain parts of the application, and that is specifically the parts of the application that are I'm not 100% sure if state-centric is exactly the term that is going to stick around for that, but um, it's, it's part that, that really capture you know, the coordination of, of, different, of different entities or so, that you know, where you have interacting state machines, like in this, in this ride-sharing app, where you have you know, the, the geo-index. There's actually, in the, in the app that we showed, there's a real like, um, layman's geo-index implemented in stateful functions and so on. It's not, it's not, completely, um, it's not completely random. But yeah, for example, things like uh, a geo-index interacting with riders, interacting with drivers, and so on. Things where, you know, we, the functionality that we execute is, is mostly, it's very quick. It's, its main purpose is, you know, interacting with the state and coordinating between different states, making decisions. Um, um, yeah, simple business logic. I think this is where, where this, is, where this uh, can be a really great fit. Um, and it, it's not that this is, you know, now that we have this, we don't need stream processing anymore. I think stream processing has a very, is a very good place there as well, next, next, to these, um, next to these applications, because there's a very different way in, you know, in, the, in the logic that you think here and, and here. So stream processing still um, is is a much, I would say, both easier and more powerful paradigm if you think of, you know, in terms of things like data preparation, combining um, multiple events together, aggregating them, building statistical summaries, building uh, feature vectors for, uh, for a machine learning model, and so on. Everything that, you know, builds on filtering, enriching, aggregating, joining events in, in whatever way. And I think at the same time, there's also, there's also a really good place still for, for functions as a service, and that is um, everything that really is um, all about, here's an event, I don't need any contextual state, the event has all the information I really am interested in, now I need to do something compute intensive or maybe, you know, blocking interaction with another system that, um, that is, you know, that, that is not directly part of my, of my core logic. And anything that's really more occasional or spiky, I think this is where functions as a service really excels. So let me try to come up with an, with an example that pulls it all together, and again, apologies to the Lyft and Uber folks. Um, so... Yeah, if, if I were to, you know, to, to think where would all of these things fit together, um, then there's a good place, I think, for stream processing in something like you know, computing travel, traffic models, doing um, things like demand forecasting and pricing and so on. I think that's actually where stream processing is also used in these companies these days, at least if I, you know, if I go back to other talks um, from previous conferences. Then if we look at, at the, the, the logic that is in, in the example that we had there before, let's say we were managing the life cycle of a ride, the driver to ride matching or so on, or um, you know, let's take the an equivalent uh, case from, from e-commerce or so, when we're, you know, when we're actually managing the checkout, we're kicking off the logistics chain and so on, we're updating our inventory. Uh, things like these, um, I think would be good matches for, for stateful functions. 
And yeah, then there's at some point, you know, where the whole thing is done, where we're kicking off the billing. And let's say as part of the billing, what would we need to do? You know, the, the passenger took the ride. We, we know the price and everything. And you know, we, now we have to render an image. Um, we have to you know, com uh, build a PDF, you know, call into these uh, libraries that do that, and then send off an email. And, and for that, that, that's really the perfect match for functions as a service, because it is, it is rather compute intensive. You work a lot on an individual event. It is something that um, you know, the event captures most of what you really want to do here. Um, it's not that you need to interact with five different states to, to figure out what you should actually be doing with this event. So this is where I think functions as a service really, really excel. And you know, there's, a, there's a really interesting way for all of these things coming together. We're, we're, more, um, you know, we're more looking at the aggregation of events. We're looking at, um, at individual events and the interaction of states. And now we're just doing something really intensive on an individual event. So yeah, there's, I think these things can, can actually be, go together pretty well. Um, I'm almost at the end of the talk. There's two more things I would like to mention. First of all, maybe the question everybody's wondering, is this actually a Flink thing? Um, it's not a Flink thing, not yet, but I personally would really like it to be a Flink thing. So as of today, it's fully open source on our GitHub account under the Apache Software License 2. Um, so you, you can, you can you know, start using it. Um, be aware that it is a project that is, it is, it is the, it's a first version. We're, will probably change things as, as we go. Um, you know, there's still a lot to be figured out on how to, to make these APIs and all these interactions really, really um, smooth and natural. Um, and yeah, also, you know, as Flink develops, as the engine underneath the hood, this will develop a bit. But it is, it is there today. Uh, the, in the next days, we'll actually propose this uh, for contribution uh, up to the Apache Flink community. And because it's, you know, it's an open source community, um, the decision whether this becomes a Flink project actually lies with the open source community. So um, I am optimistic that this is something that the Flink community will also like. It's something that really fits well in the scope of stream processing and, and what the Flink project is doing. But uh, yeah, stay tuned for any updates. For now, if you want to check it out, it is on Verica's GitHub account. And um, finally, I would really like to say thank you to everybody who has, um, has pushed hard in, in, in making this uh, project come together, together over the last six months. Um, you know, it, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a very simple thing, just a stateful function. It's good that it sounds like a simple thing because all good things are simple in the end, but there's also a lot of, uh, there's also a lot of work involved in, in making this real. So I'd really like to thank Igal, Marta, Seth, Gordon, specifically for all the work that they put in and everyone who, who actually tried it out. Um, you know, in, in, yeah, in, let's say, in, in closed beta, gave us feedback and helped, helped us make sure that this comes together. The guy on the right-hand side is actually the Megastar. When we started off this project, it was initially called Project Megastar. And if, if, you, know, if you have a spare minute, just put in Megastar and Google Image Search and see where it takes you. It's, it's going to be fun. Um, okay. With that, I'm, I'm really done. You can actually, if you're interested in that, you can learn more on, on these websites or there's a technical deep dive session into this um, just before lunch. Thank you very much.